Hi, thank you very much. Uh, so you forgot your phone. Um, the, uh, I was very privileged to present at Google when Antifragile came out in California. And one, uh, it was six years ago. And one observation I will make is that the average age in this room is six years older than it was six years ago. Okay, so. So I'm going to talk about my book, Skin in the Game. And the book is not an idea. And the first thing before we start, I'm going to discuss how I write, okay? How the, the, the whole body of work is organized. And what is the inserto? And why it's in a fractal, organized in a fractal way. My, my idea is that if a book can be summarized, two things. One, it will not survive. And the second thing is it's not worth reading. <laughs> you read a summary. So a book cannot be about an idea. No more than a painting is about uh, something other than being a painting. So a book has to be a self-standing item that you cannot reduce. And that may communicate some message or not. That's not the relevant point. It can be organized in a way that read it in a fractal way. So the way it's written, you have sentences, paragraphs, sections, chapters, and volumes. And everything has to be integrated as a whole. So, so that was the idea, that's the idea of the inserto, five volumes uh, on uncertainty. And, and, and the idea is uh, to write, you know, for the author, to write on his or her own terms. That's my idea of how an author should write. And I do it myself with uh, passion, all right? I write on my own terms. The first volume was Fooled by Randomness. And um, Fooled by Randomness is an interesting book, but nobody wanted to publish it. Nobody could figure out what it was about. It had probability, it had finance. And people tell me, what does finance have to do with probability? It had fictional characters, Nero Tulip. And then there's me, and they say, what does a fictional character or a fable have to do with a book? They couldn't figure out what it was about. I tell them, oh, the book is about philosophy. Ah, oh, okay, no, no, why is there any finance in a philosophy book? Or why is there a nonfiction? Uh, fictional characters in a philosophy book. So I wrote on my own term. I told them to get lost, and I kept writing on my own term. And in the end, the book survived. So what is my modus operandi while writing the inserto? Now, there is a restaurant <laughs> called, uh, it used to be a restaurant called Lindy that closed on the day this was published. It went bankrupt on the day this was published. It delivered very, very, uh, I would say, I don't know if inedible uh, conveys the right impression. Um, uh, the, the absolutely horrible. It was known for its cheesecake, but you know what happens when you get famous for cheesecake. You sort of cut corners, and it becomes inedible after a while. But tourists kept flocking in for a while until they, you know, so the thing went bust right after my book. And the problem is that the Lindy, there's something named after that restaurant called the Lindy Effect. Now, what is the Lindy Effect? It was discovered in that restaurant by actors that plays, because the, uh, the, the restaurant specialized in giving a cheap coffee or almost undrinkable coffee to unemployed actors. So, you know, and then when you're unemployed actors, actors, by the way, are usually unemployed particularly on Broadway. So they would sit down and talk about <laughs> plays, right? So the, uh, they discovered that a play that had been around for 200 days had an extra 200 days of life expectancy. And, and a thousand days, a thousand more days. It was discovered at, and uh, it became known as the Lindy effect. And about every single generation of mathematician had tried to model it and each the models always work, but eat, you know, but complete different models, all right? And the last iteration is the one I've been working on, <coughs> on Lindy effect. Now, how do I use the Lindy effect? Well, very simple. When I write, when I started Fooled by Randomness, is if you want your book to survive, how do you write? Can someone tell me? How do you make your book survive? What's the trick? If you want people to read your book 10 years or 20 years from now, if you want to have any chance of that happening, That works, but there's got to be something else. What else? <laughs> Sorry? Mm, that may work. Show that you, it's like the inserto is not body parts, but it's one whole. Yes? Use all the ideas. Very good. 
use old ideas. The Badalindi effect in old technology has a huge survival advantage over new technology. Okay, like uh, I'm not saying that the future will not be technological, but I'm saying that what will be displaced is a newer technology, not the old technology. <laughs> so, the way if you want to write something that can be read 20 years from now, or hope to be read 20 years, from now, make sure it could be read by someone 20 years ago. So project yourself backward in time. It's much easier than go forward. Had someone read the book in 1960, 1980, would he or she have, you know, you know, would it have been interested in the message, in, in the treatment? Yes, no. If yes, that's exactly how you do it. So it's basically backwards. People who think that the work, the, they have to be technological for the work to survive, it's the exact opposite. By the Lindy effect. Simple logic. And effectively, if you want to predict the future, you can't predict what new will happen. Nobody predicted Google. Okay, your your grandparents didn't think that you guys would be wearing a gym clothes and a you know a, like a, with with a, with the dog friendly uh, things delivering sushi for free. Okay, and uh, so and and cappuccino actually uh, very good cappuccino. I mean, I remember when I first came to New York, the, how it tasted. So your grandparents didn't predict that. You cannot predict, but you can predict something, which is that what is recent will be replaced by something more recent. So it's easier to predict that what is fragile can break and what is by the Lindy effect. So it has some, for some domains, it doesn't work for all domains. So now that I, okay, spoke about literature, it's good, good enough. So now we can move on, move to uh, skin in the game, okay? Now skin in the game, I have absolutely no idea what skin in the game is about. Because every time I try to explain it, I come up with a different story, <laughs> okay? So it means it has a lot of layers, multi-layer, okay? Uh, the only problem is it doesn't have Fat Tony, my character of previous books, because I killed him at the end of uh, Anti-Fragile, and I, uh, and I couldn't really, I didn't know how to get him back, all right? I had to, I looked at how Sherlock Holmes came back, and it was anachronistic, so I, I, I didn't know how to do it, okay? So, uh, so I'm sorry, uh, so for this uh, episode of the inserto, Fat Tony will be absent. However, his wisdom will per permeate the book. So if someone asked me, what is Skin and Game about? Let's say about how Fat Tony learns things, how he would view the world as compared to some bureaucrat. Simple, okay? So that's one, one approach. Now a little bit of background about how I got, this is by the way the German edition, and they, had, they, they couldn't translate it to German, so they had to translate skin in the game by skin in the game, okay? So that's German for skin in the game. So the, uh, my national origin is this. Okay, I was, a, I was a trader, so I didn't become uh, someone mathematically uh, oriented early on in life. First, I had to become a trader. Now, you learn when you're a trader, first of all, you learn that, um, that uh, mathematicians and people who model are full of S star. I don't never spell it out in my books, so let's, uh, let's use baloney as a good proxy. But whenever I say baloney, you know what I mean, all right? So, that theoretician and academics are full of baloney because we have a view of the formulas we use that is organic, bottom-up, and this led to anti-fragile where I was explaining that architects always do a better job when they don't use Euclidean geometry, when they use the rules acquired by architect, not mathematical top-down rules, bottom-up. So, but I discovered probability in a, in a specific way bottom up, okay, it was different. And then start getting into the field, coming from the back door. And after, uh, you, know, w w you know, after you stop trading, I couldn't find anything interesting to do with my life, okay, that was, uh, so I decided to do that stuff here, okay. That's my retirement from trading. And of course, uh, you know, with a mission, so I came from practice to theory, and usually people go from theory to practice, particularly in something very technological or something very scientific. But this parallels what I showed in Antifragile, that, um, and, and that we had so, so much evidence from history, that people had the illusion 
that technology comes from science, <laughs> okay? When in fact, science comes from technology, <laughs> more often. Except for well-advertised things, most sciences came from technology. In other words, they started doing something, didn't know exactly why it worked, and then someone claimed credit later on, what I call lecturing birds how to fly. So, so starting working with probabilistic models, and I realized that people who traded have a different view of the world than those who came from theory, which is obvious, as Yogi Berra would say, in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice, and practice there is, so it's a different mindset. But there's something else I figured out, that those who became practitioners after knowing theory always blew up. Okay, so in other words, practice didn't help you if you came from theory, right? There's something in the mindset of people who studied economics or something that made them blow up, okay? Uh, with the exception of the mathematicians because it's sort of theory free. The mathematics is just some kind of list of things that you believe to be true, basically. So, uh, and among these things, there's something I call the ludic fallacy. Now, why am I talking about ludic fallacy? Because I, when I Googled, as you, you guys, uh, it's like, uh, invented the word, I'm using Google, you know, when I search for it on the web, <laughs> okay, the, uh, the, I discovered this very ugly painting by a fellow called Isaac McCaslin, exhibited at the Saatchi Gallery, called The Ludic Fallacy. I don't see the connection with my work and my word, The Ludic Fallacy, but let me explain The Ludic Fallacy, and I hope it's not as ugly as this. Ludic fallacy is that the probability we, or the risk and uncertainty that we encounter in real life has very little to do with the uh, thing you, you encounter in casinos and games. And ludic is game, from game, coming from games in Latin. That, that's what I call the ludic fallacy. So, uh, so this is sort of like preparing the background for skin in a game. And incidentally, the main idea of the inserto if the incertos, if one asks to, to describe it, I say it's a series of uh, uh, fables, what, uh, what do I call it? Um, an investigation of opacity, luck, uncertainty, probability, la la la. Okay. Um, in the form of personal essays with autobiographical sections, stories, parable, philosophical, historical, and scientific discussions. So basically, it's a mishmash of things that are turn out to be readable for some. Okay, or for at least uh, they pay the price, okay? Whether they read it or not, it's not, you know, <laughs> I, I, I got the same. The, the money doesn't change, okay? And, but there's one point about the inserto, pervading the inserto, and I realized too late, you know, to put it in, in the book, is that there's a lot of uncertainty in the world. There's a lot more uncertainty than you think there is. But the way <laughs> to deal with such uncertainty is unique. So in other words, there is a lot of certainty about how to act under conditions of uncertainty. You see, um, a very simple uh, example. If you receive from uh, Araka, which is in Syria and ISIS and ISIS thing, a package, all right, written on it, you know, it originates in Raqqa, this is a package. What do you do with it? Do you open it? <laughs> no, so you have a lot of certainty what to do with that package, all right? So under, the more uncertainty there is, the more certainty there is of what to do. If you really don't know if the plane is robust, you don't get on it, okay? So the more uncertainty about the plane, the more certainty about not getting on it, okay? So, and this is sort of like what, what, what permeates the inserto, but I couldn't put it in, in concise terms because it takes a while. It takes me 25 years to bring an, an, an idea to its summary, you see? So maybe, you know, if you invite me to give another talk here, in five years I'll be explaining skin in the game. So, the, uh, so now, simple application of skin in the game to make you really realize what's going on with uh, our knowledge of the world without skin in the game. I haven't explained yet skin in the game. Um, this is commonly known as a restaurant, okay? A friend of mine who, like me, was a trader, he was a former partner at Goldman Sachs, an oil trader, so he talks like oil traders, got in a very bad idea to invest in a restaurant business. And if I have one piece of advice, in case I die here, just don't invest in a restaurant business. Don't open a restaurant, okay? Um, unless you really uh, want to lose your money slowly, all right, or, or sometimes quickly in New York City. So he discovered the following, that uh, the restaurant business has a lot of 
uh, prices. The best sushi in Lower Manhattan, the best sushi, uh, uh, you know, uh, with music, best sushi, with that, whatever. Uh, so you have all these categories, okay? And then there is the best restaurant in that category, all right? The best rare steak, the best T-bone, uh, whatever, west of uh, the Hudson, whatever. you have all these categories. And uh, there are prizes, actually. Now, who decide on these prizes? Journalists and other restaurant owners. There is a gala dinner where they give these prizes. And guess what? Most restaurants who got prizes were closed, <laughs> were shut down, all right? Were shut down, no, you know, out of business, okay? So it tells you the following. Any business where you're judged by your peers and not by some contact with reality is going to rot <laughs> eventually, all right? And that's why companies go bust. That's what happens. Now, the, this person, I think, is a plumber, right? Are plumbers judged by other plumbers, or they're judged by? OK, they're judged by other plumbers, no? Uh, no, they're judged by you, your client. OK, very good. So if you, you know, they may love you, other plumbers, but that's it. So any business that, where you have contact with reality in the form of your client judging you, OK, will has more, you know, uh, has fewer expert, pro what I call expert problem, which I outlined in the Black Swan. An expert being, I used to call an expert an empty suit, until I discovered that a lot of them actually don't wear suits anymore. Well, time have changed, so I have to rename it to something else. That's not Lindy, you know. The, the, uh, so there are a lot of classes of people. There's a tableau in the Black Swan. Who's an expert? Weather forecasters, they're experts. Climate, uh, hmm, 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 we don't know. All right. Uh, accountants, they're experts. Okay, if they can add them, subtract, you, you know, you can pretty much have the evidence that they pretty much and follow the rules of the various accounting rules. So they're experts now. How about uh, financial economists? Not experts. <laughs> okay. So, so, but so you have it, it's very, very simple. No contact with reality. No feedback from reality. So that's skin in the game. That's the epistemology of skin in the game. And you can apply it to a lot of things. People in policy making, they're not experts. Anything macro, it's much easier to micro BS than micro BS. And that's the motto of the book, OK? So when micro BS, you don't see the feedback. You know a dentist will be an expert, but an epidemiologist will not be an expert, OK? Because there is no feedback. That's, that's skin in the game. And this is very simple Darwinian um, survival. Simple. I mean, it's not too complicated that it's Darwinian survival because it's very simple. You have a selection process that, that you know, you survive, right? Like in nature, you have fitness. So you have all these people who reject the idea of intelligent design, which they interpret, say, in a naive way, first order way, not as a metaphor. But, it, but they want to be like academics, they want, you know, no contact with reality. They want just rationalism to make things work. It doesn't work that way. I mean, you cannot believe in God when it comes to academia, but disbelieve in God outside. You have to be consistent, OK? So and this, of course, you remember this cartoon, which violates my idea of, of the pseudo expert, because they say these smart pilots have lost touch with regulate, uh, regular passengers like us. Who thinks I should fly the plane? So the point is, what we're observing is not a riot against experts. It's a riot against a certain class of experts. I call those the IYI, intellectually at idiot, because of lack of contact with reality. Anything like academia doesn't have contact with reality <coughs> collapses.